today I am going to talk about uh, costing, costing of equipments and how the equipment cost is going to impact on the final selling price of a product. In the last class uh, I did mention that uh, sometimes fermenters are expensive, sometimes the downstream steps are expensive and uh, downstream steps may contribute to 30 to 60 percent of the overall equipment cost as well as the um, overall manufacturing cost. So, how do we judiciously select downstream equipments in addition to their efficiencies and separating um, principles, um, how cost is going to play important role in your selection process and that is what we are going to talk about in today's uh, lecture and I am going to introduce many terms like uh, depreciation, fixed cost, working capital, uh, payback period and uh, the present net present value and so on actually and all those are very, very important if we are going to select uh, one equipment over the other. For example, um, should I select a filter for removing solids from a slurry or should I select a centrifuge? So, how do you decide? Based on efficiency of course, we will decide, but then in addition we can also use the cost factor as well. How much will a centrifuge cost? How much will a filter cost? What will be the expenses for running a filter? What will be the expenses for running a centrifuge? So, sometimes you may make the decisions based on the costing and that is what is all about in today's lecture. Uh, so, what are the contributions towards equipment cost? It is not only just buying the equipment, okay, but then uh, there are so many other things that may come into towards the running of the equipment. Okay. So, contributions towards equipment cost could be reactors, fermenters, then there could be cost of the downstream units like filtration units, isolation units, that could be membranes, that could be um, things like uh, um, um, liquid liquid extraction units, then the purifications could be different types of uh, um, uh, chromatographies or crystallizers and then the dryers and then in addition we also have to consider the utilities because uh, uh, no biochemical engineering manufacturing facility runs without uh, cooling water or steam or hot oil, chilled water, gases and so on actually. So, all these contribute to the equipment cost. Now, what are the things that contribute towards the operating cost? Operating means running, raw material cost, the various raw materials which will use in your media preparation, solvents, you may be using lot of solvents um, in your extraction and uh, other separation processes, gases, you may be using gases and then power, the electricity which you will use. So, all these contribute towards the operating cost. So, you have equipment cost, cost that is uh, related to the equipment and then cost related to the operating as well actually. Now, the cost of the equipment not only includes the direct cost of the vessel, suppose I am buying a fermenter which may cost 20 lakhs or 25 lakhs, but then I need to spend money on installing it, that means I need to spend money on the civil work, fixing it, then I need to put pipings for the raw materials to come in, for liquids to go out, for gases to escape electrical fittings, insulations, contractor fee then and somebody who comes and sets up the whole uh, equipment. So, the cost of the entire fermenter may be not only the cost of the equipment, the fermenter, but all these so that the fermenter is made operational. So, generally it can even end up twice or even three times the actual cost of the fermenter. For example, if I spend like 20 lakhs to buy a fermenter, I may spend another 20 lakhs to do the fixing of the fermenter, uh, putting in pipes, putting in electrical fittings, uh, putting in insulations and um, having people actually as fixing the whole fermenter. So, that may run up to another 20, 25 lakhs actually. Okay. So, that is how we need to do the costing. So, the cost of the equipment plus all other costs to make it operational or make it running. Now, there is something called fixed cost and variable cost and I am going to tell you what is fixed cost. Okay, these are the costs required to produce any product. Okay, they do not change based on the volume of the product, whether I make uh, 100 tons per year or whether I make 120 tons per year, the fixed cost will be always fixed, it will not change. For example, if I am putting certain facilities, uh, administration, um, I am not going to change the number of people in the administration or facilities whether I am making 100 tons or 120. Okay. Then I will be paying some interest on the loans I have taken, 
there will be something called depreciation expense all these will be fixed irrespective of whether I make 100 tons per year or 120 tons per year these are called fixed cost that means the num number of people people in the administration people in the research and development people in the technical service people in the quality control I am not going to change the number of people whether I produce this year 100 tons and next year 120 tons same thing I am the amount of interest rate I may be paying may, is fixed whether I make 100 tons or 120 tons because the amount of interest I pay depends on how much money I had taken and that is always fixed same thing happens to the depreciation also and um, the amount of uh, uh, money that gets depreciated on those equipment will not change whether I make 100 tons per year in 2015 or 120 tons per year in 2016 that is why it is called fixed cost. Um, so, analogous to that we also have the variable cost. So, these variable cost will change or vary depending upon the volume of production or service I am giving. So, if I am making 100 tons per year um, I will have certain variable cost and if next year I make 120 tons I will have different variable cost because the raw materials I will be buying is going to be more, transportation will be more, sales will be more, I may be using more electricity, more water, more utilities. So, those will be more. So, depending upon the amount I am going to make the cost also will vary that is that is why it is called variable cost. So, the total cost is the sum of the fixed cost and the variable cost. So, fixed cost is always fixed irrespective of how much I make whereas, variable cost will vary depending upon the quantity of material I produce. Okay. So, the raw materials, the, the, the consumables, um, the electricity, the labor cost, the transportation, sales, commissioning all these will be varying depending upon how much I am producing. So, the total cost is sum of both. Okay. So, if I want to make a profit I need to consider the total cost for manufacturing certain amount of my product in the year 2015. So, this is a very important uh, number to have so that you will add on top of it other cost like uh, interest rates, depreciation and so on and then you calculate um, your selling price of your product. Okay. Okay, there is something called depreciation. I would like to introduce what is depreciation because this is the expenses spread on the cost of the major equipment over a period of time that is the life of a equipment. So, for example, um, if an equipment lasts for 10 years and I bought the equipment for 10 lakhs then the cost of the equipment keeps going down every year by 1 lakh right. That means, the actual value of that equipment is becoming uh, cheaper and cheaper over the period of its life. So, depreciation is applicable for all hardware, all hardware equipments like buildings, vehicles, computers, equipment, furniture, fixtures, um, your, your chromatography or fermenter everything will have a depreciation value actually and uh, the, the, the life depends. For example, a high tech uh, product like a computer may have 2 years lifetime whereas, a building may have a lifetime of 15 years. So, a filter may have a life of, lifetime of uh, 8 to 10 years. Um, so, high tech equipment may have a very short life and whereas, uh, low tech equipment may have a very long life and uh, there is something called resale value that means, how much value at which you can sell it at the end of the life. Sometimes, uh, nobody will buy that equipment, <coughs> it may be selling as a junk that means, uh, it will not have any resale value. Okay. Just like cars, if you have uh, um, cars, high end cars, it may have a resale value whereas, if you have very low end cars at the end of 10 years or 15 years, people will buy it as a junk. So, same thing is there actually. So, depreciation is uh, applicable to all equipment and assets and it, it spans over the life of that particular asset actually. For, so, it can last 5 years or it can last 10 years like I said uh, a computer's uh, uh, life can be even 2 years actually. So, there is a formula it is called rate of depreciation original value minus residual value that is the resale value. So, if the resale value is not there then that will become 0 divided by the expected life. Okay. So, that is what is called rate of depreciation. For example, I am buying a filter for 5 lakhs and then uh, uh, you expect it to last for 5 years and then its uh, residual value or resale value is 40,000 rupees. So, what will be the rate of depreciation 5 lakhs minus 40,000 by 
5, 5 is the total amount of year. Okay? So, that is how you calculate the rate of depreciation. This is very, very important because when you are calculating the um, fixed cost, you need to consider the depreciation. So, if there is a, is there is a factory where you have spent about 10 crores of uh, uh, money for buying all the equipments, they will all have a depreciation. So, next year it will be less than 10 crores and so on. So, that amount needs to be added to the fixed cost. For example, even in our cars, when you buy a car for say 7 or 8 lakhs and uh, the next year the, uh, the cost, the price of the car will be less than the original price um, based on the depreciation value. Especially when the insurance is uh, put on the car, they calculate the depreciation value and then the insurance is calculated based on the depreciated value. So, then there is something called payback period. How many years I will take to get the amount of money I have invested? Okay, that is very, very important because I would like to have a very small payback period so that whatever I have invested, I get the money back very fast. For example, if I have put 1000 crores to um, put up a plan okay, and uh, every year I am getting 50 crores that is profit after tax. You subtract all the expenses, tax, everything you are getting 50 crores as your profit. Okay, then the payback period will be, I have put in 1000 crores, I am getting 50 crores annually. So, 1000 by 50 is 20 years. That means, in 20 years, I am getting the, um, the entire money I have put in there. And um, this is very important because if I have two projects and I want to plan which one to put my money, especially as a venture capitalist, I would like to know what is the payback period. And if the payback period is smaller, then I would like to put my money in that because I will get the money back very fast when compared to a project where the payback is much longer. Net present value, this is also very, very important. Um, it compares the value of uh, money today to the value of the same money in the future. Okay? For uh, We all know that uh, money loses its uh, um, um, value as we go along. For example, we always say um, our father could spend with 100 rupees. Uh, what um, we take uh, now almost 1000 rupees. So, the value of the money has gone down. Maybe our grandfathers would have used maybe 10 rupees to get the same value. So, the um, value of the money goes down and um, so the net present value is very, very important for us to calculate. So, a 1000 rupees in the year 2016 is not the same as the 1000 rupees in 2015. So, uh, it will be much less. And uh, uh, if somebody says, uh, you give me 1000 rupees today and I will pay you 1000 rupees in 2016, actually you are losing money because the value, net present value of that 1000 in 2016 could be much less. It could be even 950 rupees or even 900 rupees depending upon the, um, the person interest actually. So, why does it happen? It happens because of uh, the value of money goes down, there is inflation, the cost, the prices of all the items, services go up. So, money has loses its value as time goes on actually. And uh, there is something called discounted cash flow. This is the method we use to calculate the present cash flow proje projections. That means, if I am running a plant and I get uh, 1 crore in 2016 and uh, 1 crore in 2017, 1 crore in 2018 and so on, uh, I cannot say 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3 crores is what is the current net present value or current value, right? Because as I said, a 1 crore in 2016 could be much less than 1 crore in 2015 and the 1 crore in 2017 will be much less than in, in 2015, much less and 1 in 2018 will be much, much less. So, the current cash flow, if I um, bring it down to the current date, will be much less and there is a formula for calculating this discounted cash flow and I will show you here actually. So, a 1000 rupees in the year 2000, say 10 that is today is more valuable than getting it uh, the 1000 rupees in 2011 that is future for example. Okay? So, the money of 2 rupees 1000 in 2011 has a value lesser than today's value. So, how do we calculate that? Okay? So, there is uh, something called the discounted cash flow by which we can calculate because the purchasing power has come down and down actually because of that plus inflation and prices of goods also go up and so on. So, future value is the present value 
into okay, 1 plus r, where r we will call it the interest rate. Okay. So, the future, so today's 1000 is could be equivalent to a much larger than 1000 based on this formula that is 1 plus r, r is the uh, interest rate that is co cost of uh, uh, tying up capital and allow for the risk that the payment may be made and so on actually. Generally, uh, r is taken as 10 percent, this is what uh, generally followed. So, 10 percent means r is equal to 0.1. So, the future value that is the next year's value of 1000 rupees of today will be 1000 into 1 plus 0.1 that is 1100. That means, uh, a 1000 rupees today is equivalent to 1100 rupees next year or 1100 rupees next year 2016 is equivalent to 1000 rupees 2015. So, I can extend this further uh, for, so if I consider 2017 then uh, 1000 rupees today is equivalent to 1210 in 2017. So, a 1210 in 2017 is equal to 1000 in 2015, a 1100 in 2016 is equal to 1000 of today okay? and that is what is called the discounted present value. So, how do you calculate? The same the formula can be put this way or in the reverse way. The future value is discounted present value into 1 plus r raised to the power n or discounted present value will be equal to future value in year n divided by 1 plus r raised to the power n. So, this is coming in the denominator for calculating present value because it will keep coming down. Here 1210 in 2017 is equal to 1100 in 2016 and it is equal to 1000 in 2015. So, it is coming down. Okay? So, that is why it comes in the denominator. It is a very useful um, formula to use to understand the cash flow because um, when you set up a company and you, sp you have spent some money in the capital, your profit is not coming all today. The profit is coming in 2016, 17, 18, 19 and uh, you cannot add up all these and call it as a total profit because there is a um, money has losing value every year. So, we need to use this type of uh, discounted present value concept to calculate what is the value of the money um, as of today when compared to the money that is given one year from today or two years from today or n years from today and that is what is called the cash flow and this is very, very important for us to understand. Okay. So, um, as I said if I have a 1000 today, if I say 2010, 1000 today and if I 2011, 1000 is equivalent to 1000 divided by 1 plus 0 0.1 raised to the power 1. So, it becomes 909. So, in 2012 if I get 1000 rupees that is equal to 1000 divided by 1 plus 1.1 into 1.1 that is 826. So, in 2013 if I get 1000 rupees that is equal to 1000 divided by 1.1 uh, 1.1, 1.1 multiplied together that is 1.1 cube that is 751 um, and so on. So, that means in 2015 um, if somebody says it is 1000 rupees in 2010 it is equivalent to 620 rupees okay? and uh, if somebody says 1000 uh, rupees in 2014 that will be 683 rupees of 2010 you see. Um, if somebody says 1000 uh, rupees in 2013 that is equivalent to 751 rupees uh, uh, in 2010. So, um, if somebody says I will give you um, 1000 rupees in 11, 12, 13, 14 and 15 and you are in the year 2010, you cannot just say I will be getting 5000 rupees from him, but I um, will be getting actually 909 plus 826 plus 751 plus 7683 plus 620 that is called the discounted cash flow that is called the present based on the present value of 2010 year that will be the discounted cash flow. And this is uh, important as I said when you are calculating profits because your profits are not coming in one single year, but it is spread over many, many years in the future the next 10, 20 years. So, that um, amount of money of uh, say 1000 rupees in 2020 or 30 is not same as the 1000 uh, rupees of today okay? and that is where we use this formula. And uh, that's, that this is the formula, the discounted cash flow is equal to the cash flow in that year divided by 1 by r raised to the power, if it is 1 year it is 1, 2 years you put 2, if it is n year you put n and that is how we calculate the 
discounted, discounted cash flow. Okay. Um, so, I would have spent some money today um, and then I am going to get um, money back next year and so on and so on. So, I will calculate the discounted cash flow and then I will see uh, whether the discounted cash flow is greater than my uh, CC okay, or if it is less than my amount of money I had put in and if it is, uh, if it is uh, less then obviously, we can say uh, I am under loss. If I am going to get more cash flow when compared to the amount of money I have invested then I would say it is a profit. So, if I have suppose I buy a chromatography for um, for a cost of CC and I am getting profit every year no CF 1 in the year 1, CF 2 in the year 2, CF 3 in the year 3 and so on. So, what I will do? I will do CF 1 by 1 plus R uh, plus CF 2 by 1 plus R square plus CF 3 by 1 plus R 3 and so on and I calculate the total DCF that is discounted cash flow. Uh, I have spent CC amount of money to buy the chromatograph. Okay? So, if uh, CC minus uh, DCF f is greater than 0 that means, cc is larger than dcf that is discounted cash flow. So, obviously, I am running under loss. If cc minus dcf is less than 0 that means, dcf is larger than cc then I am making a profit out of this and that is how I need to make decisions to say should I buy a chromatograph uh, and so on actually. Okay. We can use this uh, very effectively um, when you are buying a car. We buy we all make decisions should I buy a diesel car or a petrol car. You know diesel car will cost more, petrol car will be cheaper, but then a petrol is um, more expensive than diesel. So, um, whenever I am running the car I will save on the fuel, but that saving on fuel is not immediate I am going to save in 2015, 16, 17, 18. So, the profit on savings will be over the next 10 years of the car's life, but the amount of money I have spent will be immediate. That means, I will be spending more on the diesel car while purchasing. So, I can use this discounted cash flow approach to see is it very effective or very profitable to buy a diesel car or is it very profitable to buy a petrol driven car, you understand. So, um, I am spending more money to buy a diesel car, I am spending less money to buy a petrol car, but I will be spending more on the fuel cost on petrol when compared to the cost on diesel. But the savings is not going to be immediate, it is going to happen for the next 10 years when I am running the car. So, my profit will keep coming over the next 10 years. So, I need to use this type of discounted cash flow approach to see is it profitable to have a diesel car or is it profitable to have a petrol car. Okay? Okay. So, same thing uh, you can, and this is what the formula I talked about DCF discounted cash flow you need to add this over the next uh, 10 or 15 years uh, of the um, life of that product actually. Okay. If it is a petrol driven car or a um, diesel car you need to do the same thing or if it is a chromatography column you need to do the same thing. Okay. So, we can use this in our downstream. For example, I am uh, um, wanting to decide should I buy a um, filter to remove the dead biomass or should I buy a centrifuge to remove the dead biomass. Okay. So, if I use a filter a uh, filter is very cheap, uh, chroma, um, the centrifuge is expensive. But when I use a centrifuge, I will be able to remove all the liquid very efficiently um, and uh, if I use a filter, I will the efficiency of removal of the liquid is not so good. So, if liquid is my desired product with a centrifuge, I can recover more product. So, I am going to spend more money in purchasing a centrifuge. I um, will pay less money to purchase a filter, but I will make more product in the centrifuge because it is more efficient. I will make less product in a um, filter because it is less efficient. Um, so, I make more profit with the centrifuge, but the profit is going to happen for the next 10 years if that is the life of the centrifuge or the filter. So, sh what should I do? Should I buy a filter or a centrifuge? And that is what this problem is all about actually and exactly it makes use of the discounted cash flow approach and um, we can calculate uh, as you can see here the cost of a filter is uh, 1 lakh, cost of a centrifuge is 1.5 lakh. So, just like cars, petrol and diesel centrifuge is more expensive than the um, filter, but then uh, I am going to get more product 
out of uh, centrifuge when compared to filter, more product means more profit. So, I am making profit uh, more uh, in the centrifuge, less profit, but the, the profit is going to happen in the next 5 years. So, I need to calculate the discounted cash flow and net present value okay, and see is it more efficient to have, if it, is it more profitable to have a centrifuge or a filter. This is a typical example of where a lot of costing comes in as you can see I use the concept of discounted cash flow um, so I need to decide should I go for a filter or a centrifuge. Just by looking at it you may say filter is cheaper so go for it, um, but then uh, I am also going to get more product because centrifuge is more efficient, it will uh, uh, take out more product. So, but then that profit is coming the next year, next year, next year and so on for the next 5 years. So, how do I really judge that, that is where this concept of discounted cash flow comes into picture. So, that is what I am doing actually, I will see the yield of the product, I will see if the centrifuge is used. Uh, how much product I will get, if a filter is used how much product I will get. So, I, uh, if I use the filter the profit will be 7.2 lakhs, if I use the centrifuge the profit will be 7.8 lakhs. So, every year I will keep getting profit, but the filter costs 1 lakh, centrifuge costs 1.5 lakhs which is the expense I need to put in immediately, immediately means year 0, but the profit is coming one year after another for the next 5 years. And then I also spend some money on maintenance of the filter and centrifuge. So, maybe centrifuge maintenance is higher. So, again you can do maintenance also on the discounted cash flow. Okay. So, I make a excel sheet like uh, purchase, this is the cost I am spending and then um, profit coming over the next 5 years, then I calculated the discounted cash flow from year 1 to 0, year 2 to 0, year 3 to 0, year 4 to 0 and then when I do all these calculations. I will see that um, centrifuge is more advantageous than a filter. I okay? will make a profit of extra profit of 57,775 um, although I spend 1.5 lakhs buying a centrifuge. This is a very useful um, problem because many times you make decisions, most of the times you make decisions based on the yield, purity, operability, but cost plays a very important role ultimately it is the cost of the equipment that uh, is going to decide because uh, if you remember the previous class I talked about uh, the cost of downstream units, the cost of uh, operating a centrifuge, cost of operating various units and so on. So, you need to understand uh, uh, that cost plays a very important role and decisions can be made based on this cost actually. So, when you are selecting an equipment it is not only yield, purity, temperature, pH, pressure, amount of consumables, cost, annual maintenance contract, other expenses you are going to put in, how easy to operate, how much waste is generated, can I move from one unit to another unit operation um, all these we need to consider actually. So, when we are designing equipment we are talking about cycle time, operating parameters, hardware, um, designing equipment involves design equations, vendor details, safety margins and so on actually. Another interesting rule this is called the 0.6 rule. So, if I have an equipment um, say 100 liter um, uh, filter and it costs certain amount and if I want to approximately calculate what will be the cost of a 200 liter, then I can use this type of rule and this is called a 0.6 rule. Interesting, um, cost of original divided by cost of new is equal to size of original by size of new um, raised to the power 0.6. Generally, these number uh, can vary between 0.5 to 0.7. Okay. Um, so, generally we can take it as 0 0.6. So, if I am uh, operating a 100 litre vessel and it costs me 5000 rupees, how much it will cost me to operate a 200 litre vessel? So, all I have to do is I put in um, here cost of original operation uh, is rupees 5000, new operation here I will put 100, I will put 200. So, it will approximately tell you it cost me 7578. Interesting. So, same rule can be used for calculating the cost of the equipment also. Um, so, if cost of equipment 1 I know suppose 100 liter equipment I know it, its cost is uh, 5 lakhs and 200 liter I want to know approximately what is the cost. I can use this formula where this is called 0.6 rule because we are putting a 0.6 here in the exponent. So, a 100 liter vessel cost 5 lakhs, so 200 liter vessel cost how much? Okay. So, five, you put 5 lakhs here the bottom is unknown, you put 100 here, you put 200 here and when you calculate it gives you 
7.57 lakhs. So, cost of 200 liter vessel could be this is approximate especially when you are doing an approximate calculation this is very very useful. Um, but actually you may ultimately go to the vendor and find out the actual cost. But initially as a ballpark figure you want to know how much is the cost then this type of 0.6 rule is very very useful both for uh, costing an equipment as well as operating an equipment. So, today we saw a lot of interesting co um, costing related uh, terms like payback period, net present value, um, depreciation uh, and uh, these 0.6 rules, fixed capital, working capital and so on actually. These are very important in uh, deciding on uh, cost of downstream and especially when you are deciding on which equipment to buy and so on actually. Okay? Thank you very much.